Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to a CJS webinar and second of the immigrant workshop, immigration workshop. I am Keiko Yamanaka, continuing lecturer of ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. Uh, today, CJS uh, director Junko Habu is away, and I feel in her place by introducing the speaker, Professor Angela Ishii. And I will also act as a moderator for the entire event. Before I start our program, let me read our program. Um, that is the uh, acknowledgement of Ohlone occupation. Uh, today, I am speaking from the campus of the University of California, Berkeley. Before starting this event, I would like to announce that I recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of uh, Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. <clears throat> Excuse me. The successor of the historic and sovereign Velona Band of Alameda County. This land was and it continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Oloni tribe, uh, Oloni tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. I recognize that a Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use of uh, occupation of this land. Now, let me uh, let me go back uh, and repeat the same information that uh, this is a second of the CGS immigration workshop. Among the multitude of challenges Japan faces, immigration directly relate to the country's aging labor force, low fertility, and therefore declining population. In fact, Japan has brought foreign workers since the early 1990s in order to alleviate labor shortages. The Nikkei Brazilians are one of the first migrant workers contributing greatly to the manufacturing industry. The subject uh, today's speaker will address shortly. Nonetheless, Japanese government and the public are still generally reluctant to admit that Japan is already a country of immigration. This workshop is intended to provide an opportunity for us, UC Berkeley CJS community, to engage in conversation about immigration and face the gaps between policy and a practice. In the past February, in our first workshop, uh, Naoko Hashimoto, professor at Hisotsubashi University, discussed an urgent and a timely issue of Japan's refugee and asylum seeker policy. In the coming early fall, uh, we will have Dr. Yu Korekawa, a demographer at the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research, will address and uh, uh, major issues of population change, immigration, and uh, resulting ethnic diversity. Now, finally, uh, let me turn to our program today. Uh, we have a distinguished scholar and veteran journalist of the Brazilian community who will help us understand what is happening to the uh, community under the prolonged COVID-19 pandemic. Angelo Ishii is professor at the Faculty of Sociology, Musashi University in Tokyo. He was born in Sao Paulo, graduated from the University of Sao Paulo with a degree in journalism. He has lived in Japan since 1990, first as a Japanese government scholarship graduate student at Niigata University and University of Tokyo. 
as professional journalist, he worked as the editor in chief of the Portuguese language newspaper, Journal Torobem. Professor Ishii has conducted extensive field research about Brazilian communities in Japan, as well as a Brazilian diaspora uh, worldwide, with a focus on the media and the cultural issues. He also has served in the past and serves currently several advisory panels related to migration policies for the ministries of justice, education, internal affairs, and others. For some of his many publications, please refer to his bio uploaded in the CJS website. Angel, now it's your turn. Uh, the podium is open for you. Thank you, Keiko. So, uh, uh, good morning from Tokyo. Uh, I would like to Professor uh, Keiko Yamanaka and all the organizers uh, for this honorable uh, opportunity. So, uh, let me share the PowerPoint. So uh, I'm a third generation uh, Japanese Brazilian as my grandparents have migrated to Brazil uh, in 1930s. But I introduced myself as a, a first generation Brazilian living in Japan, Zainichi Burajiro Jin Issei. And I have done a, a long-term ethnography and mediography of Brazilian community in Japan from 1990 and participated in the formation of this community as the editor of a leading ethnic paper and as a leader of several migrants associations. Uh, Asahi Shimbun has featured me in the section Frontorana, Frontrunner, uh, as someone that has struggled to raise the awareness of both Japanese society and Japanese Brazilian community. And you can see me on this photo in front of a famous housing complex in Toyota City, where many residents are Brazilian. And I have done studies on the intersection between media and migration, uh, also studied the cultural production of migrants. And uh, as uh, Keiko uh, has presented me, so uh, I have also joined in many advisory committees of Japanese uh, ministries and contributed to the compilation of policy papers related to uh, multicultural coexistence, the so-called uh, Tabun Kakyose. So uh, there is the report on the fostering of multicultural coexistence by uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications issued in uh, 2006. Uh, it was the first guideline on the theme uh, by the national, uh, the central government. And uh, another one by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and IOM in uh, 2010, focusing on the awareness raising of local societies and citizens regarding the acceptance of foreigners. So for today, uh, Keiko requested me to talk about uh, how Nikkei immigrants uh, have survived the COVID-19 pandemic in Japan. Uh, comparing it with uh, two prior crises, the global financial crisis in 2008 and the earthquake, tsunami, nuclear accident, March 11 triple disaster in 2011, could help us clarify what is happening now. As a comparative case, I will briefly present some findings uh, of my research uh, with recipients of the controversial voluntary return program, uh, a travel aid for Nikkei affected by the uh, 2008 crisis. And I will uh, also uh, do a quick look at new issues, uh, the Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese descendants visa, uh, which help us understand the Japanese government policy towards the Nikkei immigrants. And also the multiple, uh, I call historicization efforts by Brazilians in Japan, which I see as a proof of their strong will to, to marking their presence in this society. So uh, they revised uh, Immigration Control Act 
came into effect in 1990 and allowed foreigners of Japanese descent to get a long-term status of residence. And as a result, although it was not a working visa, they adopted it to become de facto non-skilled foreign workers in Japan. Since then, uh, the Nikkei uh, South American origin, mainly from Brazil, have been one of the most significant ethnic minorities in Japan. For more than uh, 20 years, Brazilians use it to be the third largest ethnic community in Japan, following Chinese and Koreans. Now they are the fifth. We can see in the numbers of this table uh, that following the peak of almost 320,000 by uh, 2007, Nikkei populations saw a sudden drastic decrease due to the global financial crisis and subsequent massive unemployment. A controversial voluntary return program uh, launched by Japanese government catalyzed an exodus of Brazilians to their home country. Neither the March 11 triple disaster in 2011 nor the COVID-19 crisis did generate a big exodus of Brazilians from Japan. Many studies in Japanese and in English provide diverse accounts about Nikkei in Japan, but no one will disagree on a key factor. Most Nikkei have faced the trap of being almost eternal non-regular workers. As Professor Keiko Yamanaka has discussed in detail, segmented labor market theory and differential exclusion are useful to understand Nikkei's incorporation, as Nikkei are hired mostly as hiseiki, non-regular workers in the secondary labor market. I call this trap as the hourly pay syndrome, jikyusei uh, shokogun as the job market of Nikkei is restricted to jobs paid by the hour. This is a key point to understand what happened to them in the past and the challenges they are facing in the present. And you can see in the slide, the ads uh, in an ethnic paper in Japan with job offers with payment in hours. And in many cases, the contract being renewed month by month. On the other hand, I have paid attention to the agency and also the subjectivity of Nikkei immigrants in a transnational context that is not only circular in the binational Brazil-Japan route. For instance, one of my interviews, interviewees uh, used Japan as a hub and the money earned uh, working in Japanese factories as a source to go to Australia and France for a kind of a sabbatical year and I have found several transnational practices, strategies, and networks, not only on the individual level, but between associations and other related organizations. You can see on the slide an excerpt from the chapter that I wrote about the vibrant connections between Brazilians in Japan and Brazilians in the world through a set of diasporic events. I will talk later about this. So uh, let us uh, turn to one of the main topics uh, of today's talk, the Nikkei Brazilians and COVID-19 pandemic. I begin with two articles from the main newspapers in Japan, uh, Asahi Shimbun and Yomiuri Shimbun. So Asahi says, Nikkei still employment adjustment volves. In COVID crisis, lost jobs and places to live at the same time. Yomiuri says, Nikkei Brazilians in precarious situation, unemployed and disposable. So this is the biggest issue uh, for Brazilians in Japan, the unemployment, or in many cases, uh, subemployment, with a drastic reduction uh, on the working hours and therefore on the wages uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. There are not detailed numbers uh, about how many Nikkei became jobless because of the economic recession related to COVID, but the voluntary associations and labor unions have reported several cases of Nikkei being fired. Also, some local governments have tried to assess the needs of Nikkei Brazilians. 
The best example is Shizuoka Prefecture that did periodic surveys every three months from June uh, 20 to March 21 with uh, 119 residents, uh, most of them Brazilians. 66% per were concerned with a reduction of revenues and 54% were concerned with the situation of their families in the home country. Regarding their work, the job, 22% answered that were unemployed in the first survey in June. And in the last survey in March, nine months later, 10% were still unemployed. If one adds the 6% respondents that were jobless even before the COVID pandemic, meaning that a total 16% are facing long-term unemployment. As for the question, requests for the provincial government, 70% asked for information about medical services in mother language, 63% for interpreter services in hospitals and clinics, and uh, another 63% for interpreter assistance for bureaucratic procedures at City Hall. Another important topic is the effect on children of school age, 7% were not going to school, 4% due to the pandemic, and 3% even before that. And another 3% were considering quitting school. We could interpret this data in many ways. Uh, one preliminary finding is that the COVID crisis did not bring new challenges. It only worsened and deepened it. Old issues like chronic unemployment, language difficulties, children not enrolled in any school. My perception is that if compared to the unemployment crisis of uh, 2008, the effects of COVID crisis were less devastating thanks to a quick response both by public authorities and by voluntary associations. For instance, many Japanese experts praised the fact that the Japanese government did no distinction of nationality to provide the 100,000 yen emergency aid. In my view, the government did nothing more than its obligation. Uh, but what I want to applaud is that the Ministry of Labor, Health and Welfare has paid for advertising about Hello Work, the assistance for reemployment, re multilingual services in this ethnic media, an effort that has two good effects. Uh, it helps Nikkei workers to have reliable information about job opportunities, and it helps the survival of the weakened ethnic media, which is struggling to overcome the reduction on job advertising due to the COVID-19 crisis. One of the toughest challenges for Nikkei in Japan was the impossibility of moving to and from Brazil. In the early stages of the pandemic, Japan was the only country from the group of seven to impose a strict re-entry ban, even on permanent residents and even on holders of Nikkei visa. This table uh, shows how unkind uh, was the Japanese border control as Japan mistreated uh, Nikkei residents. Another challenge was the language barrier. One Brazilian uh, who needed psychological services was desperately looking for some professional that could speak Portuguese and told to the ethnic paper that Japanese psychologists can't understand our needs and sufferings. Also, uh, many Nikkei Brazilians can't read Japanese characters. In many municipalities, multilingual information about emergency aid related to COVID and details about vaccine inoculation were not provided in an effective way. Also, there have been big improvements on this field. Reports of poor translation to Portuguese language have been uh, reported. I will cite two examples uh, to illustrate how fragile is the provision of multicultural, uh, multilingual, uh, sorry, information. So in 2019, 
the Typhoon Hajibis uh, struck the Japanese territory. The city hall of Hamamatsu, a municipality famous for its high rate of Brazilian Nikkei population, sent an e-alert in Portuguese for residents that pre-registered their phone numbers. Instead of alerting people to avoid the danger areas close to the flooded rivers, it recommended people to take refuge next to these rivers. So the incident occurred because it was Saturday and there was no bilingual staffing duty. So an automatic translation device was used and the text was sent without human check. Fortunately, no one followed the instructions and uh, there were no victims. Uh, but the incident is a sign that two decades of multicultural coexistence policies have failed to address the informational divide as it occurred in one of the municipalities that is regarded as a role model of multicultural, multilingual policies. So the second example, the worst case of a collective lost in translation was the poor explanation about the voluntary return program to the potential recipients in each locality. So as thousands of Brazilian factory workers were laid off, the government launched an emergency package aimed at supporting Nikkei, which included an assisted return program from April 2009 through March 2010. It allowed unemployed Nikkei Jin from South American countries to apply for a fixed payment to support their return, 300,000 yen per person plus 200,000 yen per each so the program ended up serving around uh, 20,000 Brazilians. As of April 2009, the Japanese government first announced that the recipients of this assistance would give up of their right to re-entry for Tobu no Aida, a while, which could mean an uncertain long period. Only a month later, facing protests from Nikkei community and high criticism worldwide, uh, including a New York Times article, the government changed the rules to Sanen Omedoni, three years in principle. In Japanese language, the expression Omedoni uh, carries an ambiguity that is difficult to be translated in a proper way. So I have done a case study with uh, recipients of this program and my most astonishing finding was that many recipients had understood that after three years, exactly uh, three years, one would be allowed re-entry to Japan. So no one understood the meaning of Sanen o Medoni in principle. So there was not an appropriate explanation translation, both in the public meetings and in the private consultations about when the recipients of this assistance could regain their right to re-entry. And only in October, 2013, one and a half year later than the three year period was the prohibition on re-entry lifted uh, with a severe condition. Applicants should present a document assuring that they would have a one year contract from the Japanese employer. A big hurdle if one considers that most of Brazilians are hired as temporary seasonal workforce. So uh, back to the pandemic, Fortunately, uh, in the COVID pandemic, the community associations and supporting organizations uh, are more organized than in the previous crisis. Several groups and uh, an ethnic paper have helped families to fill out the application forms for public uh, emergency aids, vaccine inoculation and other services. In my view, Nikkei Brazilians are all using the know-how they accumulated in two prior crises, the global financial crisis in 2008 and the triple disaster in uh, 2011. So public-private partnerships and networks have been strengthened, both in Brazilian and Japanese sites. Some well-known NPOs have developed a close exchange of information both with the Brazilian embassy and its consulates and the local government's multicultural coexistence policy departments. This slide shows a food donation campaign organized by a NPO. 
Meanwhile, in Guma Prefecture, an NPO launched by a wealthy entrepreneur that made fortune with a recruiting agency that sends Nikkei workers to Japanese factories, so has reformed a former shopping center in Oizumi town, the once famous Brazilian plaza, and created a shelter to provide temporary accommodation for people who fell in a situation of extreme necessity due to the pandemic. On the other hand, there are heartwarming stories like a Brazilian who donated dozens of handmade masks in Shizuoka prefecture. It was not a donation for her compatriots, uh, compatriots. It was a donation for any local citizen. So this culture of solidarity, regardless of nationality, is a trend that strengthened after the March 11 triple disaster in 2011. And although few Brazilians had been affected by the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear accident, Brazilians were among the first to provide aid in the region with donations and charity events in a movement that was named Brazil Solidario. And the crucial point is that the wave of volunteer activities was not intended to help just compatriots, but all those in need, regardless of nationality. Coincidentally, the pandemic emerged at the very year of the commemoration of 30 years of the history of Brazilians in Japan. And uh, I put these two terms between quotations because uh, the notions of commemoration and the number of 30 years are both contestable. For many Nikkei, the prolongment of their permanence in Japan is not something that deserves to be commemorated. And for many of them, the 30 years had already been completed two years before in 2018, when there was an official commemoration of the 30 years starting from 1988, which means before the famous law reform that enabled Brazilians to come to Japan. By the way, uh, as uh, 2020 marked the 30th uh, anniversary of the famous uh, uh, reforming the Immigration Control Act, the Brazilian embassy and its three consulates across Japan planned, along with community leaders in each region, many events to call the attention of Japanese society to the Brazilian presence. A kickoff event was the contest of an official log mark that would be printed in all related projects. The finalists were announced in January 2020 during a celebration event at the Brazilian Embassy in Tokyo. This is the chosen logomark. Due to the pandemic, uh, most of the events were canceled or postponed. A few of them were held online as this conference about 30 years of Brazilian community in Japan hosted by the Brazilian Embassy. Interestingly, the most remarkable event about the 30 years of community was not produced by Brazilians themselves, but by a Japanese media outlet. NHK, the public broadcaster, aired a special program titled Watashi Tachi wa Gaijin Janai, We Are Not Gaijin. It mixed fictional and non-fictional contents to make an account of the 30 years of laughter and tears of Japanese Brazilians. The climax of this history based on real facts and people is the lonely death of a Nikkei Brazilian on a bench in a housing complex in Nagoya, Aichi Prefecture, where the program was filmed. So the image that lasts when one recalls the three decades of presence of Nikkei in Japan is a jobless, homeless and helpless old man whose final moments were invisible to both Japanese and Brazilian neighbors. As I showed before, the 30 years of Brazilian community in Japan had been commemorated two years before the pandemic in 2018. That was based on the logic that their history should be counted from the 80s, when first generation Nikkei you turned to Japan. In 1988, I held what came to be the first round table about Dekasegi in Portuguese. 
I wrote in the article that at that time, 10,000 people already crossed the oceans and were working in Japan. There were no significant events to celebrate at 10 years of the Kasegi. But in 2008, there were big celebrations of the year of the centennial of Japanese immigration to Brazil. And Brazilians in Japan decided that they also deserved to commemorate the 20 years of the Dekasegi migration wave. Just to cite one example, a community leader in Hamamatsu City held the Arigato Nippon event, uh, which means thank you, Japan. It aimed at thanking the Japanese society for accepting Japanese Brazilians as laborers. And it was just a few months before the Lehman Brothers bankrupt and the unemployment crisis. In my view, these 20 years events in 2008 were the big bang of collective historization efforts by Brazilians in Japan. The building of a collective memory and collective consciousness of Brazilians in Japan deserve our attention. The most visible initiative was the launch of a museum of residents in Japan in Oizumi, one of the most famous cities with a strong Brazilian presence in 2018. In the same year, the Brazilian consulate in Tokyo held a 30-year commemoration exhibition at the Immigrant Museum of Jaika Yokohama. And in 2015, the leaders uh, of Citizens Council of the Brazilian Consulate in Tokyo issued the, the Declaration of Yokohama, uh, which stated, the age of the Kasegi has ended. We chose to stay in Japan. Uh, I was asked to write the draft of this declaration. So I expressed the collective thoughts shared by all the members of the council. And uh, in 2020, the sitting councils of Tokyo, Hamamatsu, and Nagoya issued the Charter of 30 Years. So it says, we believe that the watchword of this moment is integration, which does not imply giving up of Brazil, our Brazilian identity. Another interesting initiative was a bilingual Japanese and Portuguese website created by Brazilian embassy in Japan, Memories of Tohoku. Uh, 10 years since the great earthquake in East Japan was launched in 2021. And uh, some of you uh, could recognize Pelé, the famous uh, football king. Also, the most famous cartoonist of Brazil, Mauricio de Souza, published Brazil and Japan, uh, 110 years of friendship in 2018. It traces the parallel between the Japanese immigrants to Brazil and the Dekasegi immigrants from Brazil to Japan. As we have seen, uh, Brazilians have shown a strong will and determination to stay in Japan. But I want to emphasize that they are developing, maintaining strong ties with their home country, Brazil, and with the so-called Brazilian diaspora, Brazilians in the world. Even the Brazilian government has adopted the term Brazilian diaspora in its official documents and discourses. The Brasileiros no Mundo conference was sponsored by Brazilian government in 2018. And the government created the CRBE, Council of Representatives of Brazilians Abroad, with the presence of the president of Brazil. Uh, Brazil's biggest TV network, uh, Global, has launched a huge ev event named Brazilian Day in the countries with high presence of Brazilians, USA, Japan, uh, UK. And uh, in 2010, Expo Business America was held in Boston. Uh, that was the outcome of a partnership between a Brazilian settled in Japan, Nagoya, uh, and a Brazilian settled in USA. And these two entrepreneurs knew each other thanks to the government sponsored Brazilians in the World Conference. So I have analyzed uh, these movements in detail uh, in uh, my chapter in Ishii 2017, the transnational networks between Brazilian leaders in Japan, USA, and uh, other countries. 
Now, uh, about the Yonsei uh, visa. As it's widely known, only second and third generation Nikkei are allowed long-term legal status in Japan. However, in recent years, there was a strong lobby, especially from the leaders of Japanese Brazilian community in Brazil, claiming the same rights for the younger fourth generation Nikkei. In 2018, Japanese government launched a visa for Yonsei. Some leaders of Nikkei community commemorated it as a victory, but soon many people noted that this visa was not designed to welcome Nikkei as expected. A cover story of an ethnic magazine defined it this way. A visa that separates families, imposes age limits, and obligates people to leave the country within five years. Are the Yonsei so different from the other descendants? The requirements of this, uh, the candidates of this new visa were so restrictive uh, almost the same conditions imposed to working holiday visa, that the number of applicants was far from the announced cap of around 4,000 per year. As of June 2019, one year since the new visa was launched, only 43 people had obtained this visa. In my view, the grand design of Yonsei visa was just a prelude of the format of the severe conditions imposed to Toktei Gino Type 1, Specialized Skill Workers Visa, which was announced less than one year later. And I would not be surprised if the people who designed the Yonsei visa confessed that the low adhesion to this visa was exactly what they expected. I also think that the prohibition of accompanying families should be revised for both Yonsei and the new Toktei Gino Type 1. Well, I will start my concluding remarks with what is recurrent. So in the global financial crisis, there was a massive unemployment, non-regular workers first to be fired. In COVID pandemic, not massive unemployment, but many suffering with reduced wages, Nikkei still occupying the secondary labor market. Second, language barrier had terrible effects on the voluntary return program. And uh, in the COVID, despite improvements, language barrier remains a big issue. So back in the global financial crisis, severe re-entry ban on return aid recipients. And in COVID, severe re-entry ban on foreign residents, including Nikkei. So Japanese government was not satisfied with the settling of Nikkei migrants. Lawmaker Taro Kono from LDP famously said, receiving Nikkei was a failure. And Japanese government still does not recognize Nikkei as uh, migrants, immigrants. The Yonsei visa is strong proof of this. Main ethnic media by Brazilians in Japan closed due to the uh, crisis. And Ethnic media by Brazilians in Japan still today in a critical situation. Only one magazine, uh, which I use it uh, in the slides today, with journalist content survived, and digital media don't provide enough uh, reliable information. So uh, Brazilians in Japan are non-regular workers that pursue a middle-class dream. They have pursued what they uh, believe to be a middle-class lifestyle, but remain low-skilled, low-paid uh, workers. Despite the exponential increase in the number of holders of permanent visas, a cover story in the Brazilian ethnic magazine exposes an intriguing paradox. So in Portuguese, casa própria, brasileiros deixam de ser trabalhadores temporários e assumem a condição de imigrantes, in English, own house. Brazilians leave their condition of temporary workers and assume their immigrant condition. So what struck me is that this expression reveals their illusion of being no longer temporary workers. So Brazilians in Japan remain in a fragile situation in terms of work and unemployment. 
And with every economic crisis, the risk of unemployment is immediate and merciless. Because Nikkei's visa are by status, Mibun ni Motozuku, they are an underestimated, undiscovered, medium skilled workforce. Only a few have their prior career recognized. Many Brazilians who return from Japan to Brazil have faced underestimation. They re-entered the job market not as regular workers, but as non-skilled workers. For instance, I have interviewed voluntary program returnees who got only part-time jobs as attendants in call centers and earned less than a minimum salary. And many recipients of the voluntary program explained that they avoided becoming a burden on Japan. So I don't want to rely on an assistance from Japan like Sei Katsuhogo. So the choices of staying or leaving are driven by complex factors and mixed feelings that include these kinds of, of sense of pride and dignity. Uh, I'm just starting a new research project uh, on how Brazilians are dealing with death, burial, mourning, and cemetery in Japan. And uh, related to this, a very important move was the launch of a collective grave called Memorial Restart Community in Hachioji, outskirts of Tokyo. So now to conclude, what is new and improved compared to 2008 global crisis? First, I see a consolidation of a collective know-how on solidarity efforts. Japanese government is more compromised with policies. See the effort, I see the efforts of uh, Shizuoka prefecture and central government in assessing the situation of foreign residents as a clear outcome of the multicultural coexistence policy. So I disagree uh, with the voices that just criticize the Tabunka Kyose programs as ineffective. Bad with them, worse without them. Brazilian government better prepared to provide assistance uh, to the citizens abroad. The transnational networks development among Brazilians in the world favored the willingness and preparedness of Brazilian government to deal with the needs of Brazilian migrants. Leaders of Brazilian community developed more channels with both Japanese and Brazilian government. Thanks to many historicization initiatives, the visibility of the Brazilian presence has increased. So uh, thank you and uh, obrigado and uh, arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you, Angelo, for your presentation. Now we will move to the uh, responses to his uh, presentation. Okay, so let me uh, talk about my response. Now, uh, we are so impressed by uh, uh, Angelo's talk with so many things to say, so many things to share with us. And uh, we are also mesmerized by his presentation of colorful, lively photos, uh, newspaper articles, statistics, and many remarks, comments that present the rapid growth of Brazilian community on the one hand, and many, many challenges that the community still faces on the other over for uh, 30 years. Uh, and also that this is very important for us to learn that how important the um, Portuguese mass media are to many Brazilian members in the community and uh, represent uh, their uh, voices and deliver them to Japanese society. Now I have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, three comments and questions. Uh, first, uh, that is about structural and policy issues specific to Brazilian community. I list five symbolic events that uh, are cited by Angel's talk. Uh, number one, the Nikkei Brazilians are caught by the trap of being almost eternal non-regular workers as adjustment valves of the economy. 
Number two, there are many cases of lost in translation. The 2009 voluntary return program was one most serious. Similarly, during the COVID period, uh, which still continues, uh, some local governments announced vaccination only in Japanese. Number three, and COVID, under COVID pandemic, foreigners would not have allowed to re-enter Japan once they left, indicating that even Nikkei permanent residents are treated as eternal foreigners. Number four, Nikkei fourth generation is essentially shut down at the border and there will be no more continuous flows of Nikkei. Number five, there have been a rapid increase of Southeast Asian technical interns, and they are replacing Nikkei workers in the labor force. Do these events and implications suggest that the 30 year history of Brazilian community is winding down as Japanese corporations and the government do not want to Nikkei workers anymore. It sounds like a history of mistreatment. Besides, a Japanese politician who once played a major role in Nikkei policy making said that receiving Nikkei was a failure. Uh, this is a very presumptuous, presumptuous statement, Zuzushi, uh, arrogant statement ignoring many contributions of Brazilians. In my opinion, Nikkei Brazilians are not losers. On the contrary, they are victors whose endurance and resilience led them through to survive the three major crises, the 2008 global economic crisis, 2011 great Tohoku earthquake, and the 2020 COVID pandemic. According to Angel's report, uh, they learned from the previous experience in supporting better with one another and connecting better to Japanese citizens and the local governments. 12 years later, the Brazilian community has matured to survive better their harsh reality in which they live as marginalized ethnic immigrant community. Uh, many mistreatment nonetheless. Uh, Brazilians are happily celebrating and historicizing the 30 year history of their immigration and community building in Japan. The Brazilians are now asserting themselves with pride in their unique identity and the history and linking themselves as a member of the world Brazilian diaspora. With that distinct transnational collective identity beyond being Nikkei and a Japanese border, they are and have been a big contributor in popularizing Japan's nascent multiculturalism and even future ethnic pluralism. My second comment is more realistic. I am happy to learn that many Brazilian families are now committed to stay on in Japan. More of them are buying their own houses. This indicates that they are investing in children's education. According to an existing study, living in a family owned house and advancing to high school are positively correlated among Brazilian and Peruvian populations. And yet we also know that although high school graduates are increasing among Brazilian youth, the pro uh, proportion of junior high graduates is still as high as 30%. This shows that many Brazilian children continue to reproduce their parental factory worker status and will not be likely to attain a middle-class status with professional occupations. 
This also poses a serious challenge to Japanese educational system that is not providing an equal opportunity to immigrant and ethnic minority children. I would love to hear uh, your opinions about social mobility of the uh, young Brazilian generations. Finally, my third comment is a question about gender issues. In immigration studies, it is well established that immigrant women's labor participation, labor force participation transforms gender relations toward more egalitarian relationships between spouses and elevate women's status within the families and ethnic communities. As you know, Brazilian women are also workers whose earnings contribute greatly to the family income. If you have any observations about changing gender relations and a woman's position in the Brazilian community in Japan, I would love to hear about them. So these are my three questions. Thank you so much, Keiko. So, uh, 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 so uh, I, I will try to, uh, to answer to these three uh, comments and, uh, and questions. And uh, uh, I, will, I should say that uh, I'm very relieved and happy uh, hearing uh, your comments because uh, you have uh, like uh, expressed uh, what uh, you have voiced what uh, many uh, Brazilians in Japan would like to tell to uh, Mr. Taro Kono or and also uh, other <laughs> uh, Japanese authorities. And uh, uh, I should say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Japanese uh, companies and the uh, Japanese labor market, and uh, 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 they still uh, are happy uh, having uh, Nikkei Brazilians as uh, uh, workers, as uh, laborers. But uh, what they are not happy uh, is uh, with the fact that uh, they have brought families. Uh, so, and uh, uh, some of the workers uh, are uh, older, so uh, they cannot uh, uh, work uh, actively uh, anymore. So uh, uh, the fact is that uh, uh, in the honne basis, I mean, what they uh, they really uh, want, uh, they what they really think uh, about Nikkei Brazilians in Japan. So. Uh, they would like uh, that uh, Brazilians return to the beginning. So uh, as uh, the Kasegi spirit, just uh, stay in Japan less than five years and then uh, going back to their home country, uh, Brazil. So uh, that is why uh, I have uh, emphasized the case of uh, Yonsei, the fourth generation, uh, visa uh, because uh, it reveals what is the honne uh, of uh, the Japanese side regarding uh, the Nikkei uh, Brazilians. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, not all the uh, Japanese uh, government's uh, policies towards uh, Nikkei uh, is uh, unkind uh, or cold. Uh, so it's ambivalent because uh, in the global financial crisis, when there was the, the famous uh, voluntary return program package, so it was part of a package that included many good things to uh, Nikkei Brazilians in Japan, including like uh, Japanese language courses and uh, uh, training uh, for uh, those who uh, were trying to re-enter uh, in the job market uh, in Japan. So uh, that's a point that uh, I would like to, to add. Uh, so uh, going to the second uh, point uh, about the, the 
second generation or, or children. So it's a very difficult question to answer in the sense that uh, it depends on whether you see uh, most of the youth that, as you say, Keiko, are reproducing the status of factory workers in Japan. Sadly, uh, this is the, the, the reality for the most of them. Or uh, you place high expectations uh, on the few cases of uh, secondary generation young Brazilians that are reaching prestigious universities in Japan and getting uh, very uh, good jobs. So uh, uh, I have many uh, examples like uh, this is nunca pare de estudar, so never stop studying or uh, uh, faculties uh, in Japan. So uh, very detailed uh, information on how to uh, go to universities or uh, there are some few uh, role models of uh, Nikkei Brazilians that uh, reach it, uh, good uh, universities and good jobs. So uh, it depends on uh, if we see uh, one side or uh, uh, another. Uh, what I can say is that there are some consistent collective efforts to change, uh, to improve this uh, scenario. Uh, for instance, there were some slides that I, I could not show because of the lack of time, and I would like to share uh, just for a moment. Uh, so let me try here. Like this. Uh, the, this is a Feira uh, da Educação, Education Fair, uh, which has been held in the, an annual basis in Guma, Shizuoka, and uh, Aichi prefectures. So the goal uh, is giving information and motivation for uh, young people to reach uh, universities either in Brazil or uh, in Japan. And also like this, this is very interesting because uh, uh, the four uh, people in this uh, slide, so uh, they are children of uh, Dekasegi uh, immigrants, and they grew up in Japan, and then they uh, went back to uh, Brazil, and they graduated from universities back in Brazil, and because of their background, uh, they can speak Japanese and uh, uh, they know about Japan. So uh, they were hired by uh, the Japan House Sao Paulo. Uh, so uh, they are uh, bridging the two countries. They are in the front line of the uh, cultural diplomacy. So uh, we have uh, this kind of, uh, uh, we, we, we should say, uh, uh, maybe some success uh, stories. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, sorry, so uh, last, the, the third comment question about the gender uh, issues. Uh, yes, uh, it's very clear that many uh, women have elevated their status, not only within uh, families, but as leaders of the community. So the NPO that I referred in my slides uh, has a woman, uh, Michie Sang, as a charismatic leader uh, that has uh, so leaded uh, our uh, community in Japan. And also uh, we have many female entrepreneurs. So uh, uh, not, not so many, but uh, there are. And also they uh, just a coincidence. This is the uh, latest edition, the most recent edition of the ethnic uh, magazine uh, about the, the Mother's Day. And it says the, the mother empowered. So they are uh, heroines in the, uh, uh, not only in the family, but in their career. All right, um, time is up uh, regularly. Thank you very much, uh, Angelo and the CJS for supporting uh, this long, uh, you know, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And then we have to go. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.